such good news that he will hold us fast. Um, man, that's good news. So I come from a very, uh, not literary family, that sounds like really smart, um, but I come from a family that were English and journalism majors, writers, and people that enjoyed written words and reading great works. Um, you would think that I would have fallen right in step with that, and my family would think that I'm a great reader, but as a child, I wasn't. I, I like to read, but I didn't have this diverse kind of reading appetite. Um, I wanted to read very specific things called comic books. Um, I was a great reader. Um, I could read a comic book in a, one sitting. It was no big deal for me. Um, but as I went through school, and you have to read these classic works, I'm not breathing hard, I don't think. I'm very excited, but I don't know. Maybe I should go this way. That's right, my heart rate is at least 140. Um, <laughs> actually, it's not. Uh, but the idea that we had to read these classic works in school. You had to read Huckleberry Finn. Um, and at some point, we had to read A Tale of Two Cities. And um, I was struck by the story at the end of Tale of Two Cities. It's one of the most classic references of substitutionary life-giving hope. And the two characters that somehow miraculously no one notices, it's kind of like Superman with the glasses. How is that Clark Kent? I can't figure it out. These two characters in a time of great turmoil in Paris, Carton and Darnay, look so much alike that they can be mistaken for each other. And so at the end of the story, Darnay is in prison to be executed, and he is to go to the gallows, um, the, the people have risen up and they have said that and they're going to take him away and Carton or Carton as he is I think more French but the idea that he is it's revealed to him what an awful person he really feels like he's tried to be the the good person but he's really not been he's persecuted and he's done and so in the end of the story um, another friend sneaks him in to visit with Darnay um, and Carton drugs him and they sneak out Darnay, and he takes his place, and he goes to the gallows in his place. It's not the gallows, it's the guillotine. I keep calling it the gallows, but it's, he is going to be executed in his place. And he gives this great quote where he says, what I do today is far, far better than anything else. It's a far, far better thing I do today. And he says in a very long speech of Lucy and the other children will we'll live and will explore the world and we'll become great things and maybe this one will become a doctor and this one will do this. And by taking the condemned person's place, the newly freed man was transformed. He lived a glorious life. Go this way. Maybe I just need to, there we go. He loved his family his work, even the bad days. Can you imagine if you were going to the guillotine and you had seen all this happen and now someone has taken your place? Every taste of food, every day of work, every difficult thing you'd ever experience is a gift. Because by the death of another, he was declared righteous. He was justified. And that is our text for today from Romans 5, 1 through 5. As we continue our journey through Romans some of you, I hope, are going to go, finally. We've got a lot of bad news. We have a lot of condemnation and people that we're under the wrath of God. But now we get to Romans 5 and we get to unpack. We've gotten sort of these kernels of, oh, there's something good coming. And we get here and we go, whoa, now it's good. This is good news. But we have to know that bad news. You have to know you're condemned to really enjoy this good news. And that's why Paul wrote such an eloquent, amazing letter to explain it in this process. But as we get to Romans 5, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5 today to see the effects of justification by faith. What does it mean to be declared righteous? Is it just a good theological truth? Is it something that sets us apart and says, ah, we are the ones that hold the mighty truth? Or is it something that should transform our lives and bring blessing and good things into our lives? And so we're going to just read verses 1 through 5. So read along with me. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Let's pray. God, I pray that as I speak, I would not speak my own. I pray your Holy Spirit would speak um, through your word for your glory, Jesus. And we'd see the blessing that this tremendous truth of justification by faith brings into our lives. That we don't have to be good enough for you. You have been good enough for us. And we can rejoice in all of that together today. So help us, Father, and be glorified in all that I say and all that is received. We pray in Jesus' good name. Amen. So as we think about this, I want to give you a big idea that I think Paul's really driving for here. Um, they're really the main point of these five verses. He's been building this case all through about the bad news, but here is what I think the main point Paul is going for. The good news of the gospel is that through faith in Christ, justification changes everything about a person. I'll say it again. The good news of the gospel is that through faith in Christ, justification changes everything about a person. Not just some things, not just the one day or the past, but it changes everything. Or to say it this way, the good news of the gospel is that through faith in Christ, justification changes our relationship with God. That's essential. It changes what gives and sustains our deepest joy. It changes our perspective on life and suffering. And it changes what fills us up, what really brings us life. That's a lot of blessing from one big doctrine. So I want to look at each one of those ideas, uh, the main idea, those four big things about what justification by faith. Okay, we're okay. Those four things. The first one is that justification by faith changes the relationship between God and man. Now, I think most of us would adhere to that and say, as Orthodox Christians, we understand that we're no longer in the same place as we once were if we have trusted Jesus. But what Paul has been building is an argument that we were all enemies of God before we believed in Christ. And I don't think we like to hear that. I, I, don't, I had a guy that I grew up with, and we went to church together. His mom taught our Sunday school class. And my kids have heard these stories, but he was my nemesis. And I'm not a superhero, so it's kind of weird to say that I had a nemesis because I was really just a little kid. But at some point, he always was trying to one-up me, and he couldn't. He really tried, but he usually lost. So it was probably even more embarrassing to him. He wanted to try even harder. But he and I knew there was enmity between us. We were cordial at points, but he did not like me, and I did not like him. To the point that he did all sorts of tricks to try and get away with things and make me look bad. Those stories could go on. There's multiple stories. It's a really pretty sad thing. But I had to know that there was something between us. He didn't like to hear, if somebody said, hey, you guys are enemies, we kind of sort of downplay that. And nobody likes to hear that you have an enemy or that you are an enemy. But the Bible is clear that before Christ, we were enemies of God. That we were by nature objects of wrath from God. According to Ephesians 2, listen to this description of us. From Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. It would be up here. This is really fun stuff. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's Satan. That's who we were following before Christ, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. He says, but God, right? That's the next verse that's huge. But God, rich in mercy, made us alive, right? But the, the idea is before Christ, we were natures of God's wrath. We were, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. We were his enemies. 
And that's why it's a big thing to say that justification declares us righteous and a friend of God. It says that God is declaring something true about us that is irrevocably true and substantially more true than any other truth we know or encounter. See, to the degree that we believe we stand justified in Christ, declared righteous by faith in the person and work of Christ, is the measure with which we will know and enjoy and run to God. One of the key results when we think about this of believing you are justified before God by faith in Christ is that you have peace with God. You are no longer an enemy with God. That's a huge thing, that you are not God's enemy. That he has taken you. That's what we all deserve is to, to be punished because we were his enemies. That we shook an angry fist at God by all of our deeds, all of our life, all of our words, even our thoughts. Our best deeds were like filthy rags and we rebelled against his righteous rule. And so by our nature and by our action, we were enemies of God. But God, by his gracious Holy Spirit, opened our eyes and our ears and our hearts to hear the gospel and receive it and believe it. And one of these key results of justification is you have peace with God. That God is not angry with you anymore. You are not God's enemy anymore. Jesus said he gives peace not like the world does. It's a different kind of peace. When you say that you have peace with God, you go, well, what does that mean? Like God's just sort of, he's off on a cloud anyways. He doesn't really care about what I do with my life. And that's the opposite of the truth. He's deeply invested in the lives of his people and this world. And Jesus says in John 14, 27, that peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, but not like the world does. It's not like the world does. And the big difference of what Jesus gives is something very substantial, something that can't be changed. See, the world gives it circumstantially and conditionally. It's all about if you'll get this kind of life and you'll have enough money and you'll have the right work situation, you'll have peace in this life and peace with God is the assumption. But Jesus is giving the idea that it's not just the absence of suffering or difficulty, but of positive blessing, of particularly a rich relationship with God. That you don't have to fear God anymore. You should fear God in a right understanding, but you can approach when you are in need. You can draw near to God and find help. Jesus gives peace eternally, and there's only one condition, that you trust him, that you believe justification. You believe that you are justified and counted righteous in Christ. If you don't believe that, you will be terrified of God because you will always wonder, am I good enough? Have I done enough good? Have I been to enough Bible studies? Have I given enough money? Have I been the person that I should be. There's a great scene. I love Saving Private Ryan. My kids don't watch it, don't worry. Um, as you've seen it, you're like, this is a little rough. Um, but my grandfather, one of my grandfathers, died in flying a, a bomber in that attack. Um, my great uncle stormed the beaches of Normandy. It's deeply personal to me. I love that movie because the end of it, Matt Damon's older character says, did I live a good life? He's been purchased by the sacrifice of another, and he wants to know he has thought his whole life, will I measure up? He did not know what it was to have peace with God. He didn't know the peace that comes by knowing you are justified, and no matter what you do, that you are found righteous in Christ. Jesus gives peace differently than the world does, eternally, and only based on the fact that we must trust what he has done in our place. See, if our greatest enemy is now our greatest ally, that kind of peace changes everything. Everything. You may not be at peace with everyone or every, anything else, but we have peace with God. I mean, think about if, if, if you go home today and you find out that um, the entire United States military is, is after you. And whether you're pro-military or not, that's a terrifying position to be in. The entire might, that we saw a train that just had trucks and all the things. We were coming over the Mississippi 
going back to visit family and just for, it seemed like forever. And these are just transport trucks. And you go, what is the might of the U.S. military? All the branches, all pointed to you coming to your house because they know who you are. They've seen the cell phone records. They know. And they're coming to destroy you and all you own, right? You would be freaking, you think your heart rate's high now. I mean, come on. You would be freaking out, to say the least. But to make matters worse, they're coming because you've committed treason against the country. Because they're the government, they're inescapable. But in mercy, they extend a treaty saying someone has vouched for you and all your crimes have been wiped out. And so the peace you have with what was once your most powerful enemy puts all other difficulties in the right place. You would not worry so much about what you have to do that day and if your kids are obeying and if you have enough money and you would deal with them, but you would know that that peace has secured a greater peace than anything else. And in the same way, we must remember that this is what God has done for us in Christ. And he says we exult in this truth for the rest of our lives, that we are to enjoy the peace we have with God. And part of our struggle is we're prone to forget what's been declared true of us. We, we forget that God has said, no, no, you do belong to me, and I'm not angry with you, and in Christ you have peace with me. Sometimes we look for horizontal relationships and experiences for our peace to fill us up and help us feel good. Many times when things are going well in your life and in my life, we experience a measure of peace horizontally. But when things go sour, as they will, whether it's family or jobs or church or just life in general, our peace goes out the door if it's based on our circumstances, if it's like the world gives. But we're to look horizontally and embrace and enjoy the peace of God if we want that peace that passes all understanding. Peace with God comes through faith and is sustained by faith. And if we trust that we're justified in God's sight, it says that we're believing not only verse 1, that we have peace with God. That's the main benefit right there. But he also says this at the end of verse 2. God has brought us to stand before him in grace. We don't stand before God based on our righteousness. You don't come to God in your own righteousness, and you don't stand before God in your own righteousness. You stand in grace. He says this idea that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. See, that's what God calls into, so for the re- that stand means not a one-time stand, that means for the rest of eternity you stand in grace. That all that has been held against you is gone and you stand in grace. And that's something you can enjoy because God doesn't hold your sins against you. And that is good news for this. For all eternity, God will only see us through the righteousness of his son. If you have believed on Christ, he sees the righteousness of your son. You stand in grace, not because we are good or earned it, but because of grace, because God is good, because Jesus has been good for us. This is meant to make us sing. This is why we sing. This is what's meant to make us rejoice in God. And that's what the next point is. Not only does justification by faith give us peace with God and clear away this sort of works-based trying to sort it out on our own, but justification by faith also changes what gives and sustains our deepest joy. Paul writes it this way. We've obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. There's a different way to rejoice when you believe that you've been justified by God. There's a different way to rejoice in life. It's not just a one time, because I know when I became a believer um, that my sister hugged my neck and she's like, now everything's going to be okay. And this sort of warm fuzzy that I am going to be all right. And then as troubles came and different things came into my life, I thought, this doesn't feel all right. I don't feel like life's going great. And so it's not just that God gives us an initial joy, but justification by faith is supposed to change that initial joy and sustain our deepest joy. And I used to rejoice when, like, our baseball teams won. 
and not rejoice when we lost, right? Or, or when our kids were successful or, or maybe when we get noticed or someone appreciates what you do, right? Those are kind of these fun things that we look to for our joy. But when we don't have them, we're kind of crestfallen. Because our joy is based on, again, what the world gives. Because of the Jesus life and work, we rejoice exceedingly. That's what the word exult means. It's not just a, yay, like I always think of Monty Python as saying, hooray, right? This, um, there's much rejoicing. Um, kind of this sort of, we talk about rejoicing, but this, this not getting this sort of pulled in exultation that we're meant to have that we are declared righteous in Christ that would supersede all our other joys, that would chase away fear and help us walk well with joy in the world. Now, this doesn't mean there's no joy. It doesn't mean that your kids can't give you joy and success can't give you joy. It means that this joy in God is supposed to be the ultimate. That knowing God, being a friend of God, having peace with God because of Christ is meant to stir joy in God. He calls it rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. For the repentant person that's trusted Christ and not their own works, there's a deeper, more satisfying joy that doesn't rise and fall with the day's events and turns. We're now to be those people that know that God has made us right and we will see and partake in the glory of God for all eternity. This is the hope of God's people, that they will see and rejoice in the glory of God forever. So the hope of the Christian is, yes, we will experience some level of glory here, but when we see Christ at the end of all time, when we stand before him, we will see him fully. Right now we see through a glass darkly. And we struggle to see that God is amazing, he's big, he's perfect, he's transcendent, even better than this speaking I'm doing. But the idea that we can't see yet what God is, it will be when we see him face to face, and that is our hope. That is what we're rejoicing in, is there's a rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. That when you stand before God, because you are justified in Christ, you don't shrink back. You run to him. Don't you long for that day? I hope you do, that you will see Jesus, and he will smile at you, and he will say, you are mine. That is the driving force for the Christian, to know that he will see God in all his glory, to see his perfections with these very eyes, these perfected eyes, sure, but this is we will see God and live. That is good news. And justification by faith brings us into a different kind of rejoicing, a hope for the glory of God that we will see and rejoice in it fully. The gospel is what Jesus says brings real joy. In Matthew 13, he compares the kingdom to being a treasure that brings so much joy you would sell all you had to own it. Now, remember the sort of a weird part where he goes back and he hides it? He finds it and he's like, oh, don't tell anybody. And uh, so we don't want to kind of parse kind of what's going on in that different parable. But he still wants to compare the kingdom to a treasure in a field that if you found it, you would sell all you had to get it. Well, that doesn't mean that treasure is not about a perfect life, your best life now. I'm not referencing anybody in particular. I'm just just sort of throwing that phrase. It it just came out. I don't know where it came from. Um, But the idea is that the kingdom is forever. It's unshakable. It's something that is given to us and nailed down over time, but it is fully consummated when Jesus returns. So we have this rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God and the kingdom of the gospel and his son Jesus. So it's not that there isn't any other joy or rejoicing. It's that this hope of the glory of God is our highest joy. And if it is, we don't fear what the end of life is like. We don't fear, one day I'm going to die. We're all going to die, and we don't fear that anymore. Every time I get an airplane, I'm scared. I just am. And I never was until I flew over the Andes Mountains, and it freaked me out. The plane was all over the place. But I keep telling myself, I'm like, this is why I'm not, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be afraid. What's convicting is I shouldn't be afraid because I'm going to stand before God unashamed. There is no fear, there's rejoicing. And so when we fear kind of the way life is going and we're not rejoicing, maybe we front-loaded our lives with pleasures and temporary joys to kind of hide our fear and our angst. 
kind of fill up this life so maybe our life is better now? Scared that what's to come won't be what it's promised? But justification, if we're declared righteous by faith in Christ, we understand that God has secured something for us in Christ that can never be taken away. So we can rejoice in that hope and look to that hope and really exult in it. But if we have that perspective and our rejoicing is so great in that hope, it says it even changes the way we deal with suffering, right? That our rejoicing in suffering is different. That we don't have to go through the difficulty with no joy. Doesn't mean there's not tears, there's not sorrow. But when you encounter difficulty, because you know that you will see the glory of God, whatever you experience in this life, 2 Corinthians 4.16 talks about this light and momentary trouble that can't compare to the glory that will outweigh this for all eternity. That we may go through these things, but because compared to the glory we will see and the glory will be revealed in and through us, we suffer differently. We rejoice in suffering. When we went through James, we talked about it, count it all joy. When you go through all kinds of trials, we have to know a bigger joy that helps you get through the dark times. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9 says it this way. Though you've not seen him, Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter was trying to encourage believers that were suffering. It's one of my favorite stories, the whole letter of First Peter, because he got it that life was hard. Life was challenging for people that wanted to follow Christ day in and day out. And he wanted to help them and encourage them as they were suffering and being persecuted to remember where their real joy in this life and for all eternity really lies. And so in the same way as God, we believe this justification by faith for us, we can rejoice not only in the hope of glory of God as a solo idea, but also in a way that would affect the way we encounter suffering and difficulty because our greatest enemy has been defeated. The end of Romans 8 challenges our perspective that there's something, anything we could do to separate us from God's love to us in Christ, that we are secure in that. And so we can rejoice even in suffering because our hope is not that our glory would be in this life. Our hope is in the life to come. And so how do we have that kind of perspective? I'll give you these two other thoughts about effects of it. Well, the third thing is that justification by faith changes our perspective on life and suffering, right? That we can rejoice in it but we, the American dream teaches us that if we make a lot of money, have a good retirement, great kids, good friendships, um, we're successful in, in almost everything we do with a few hiccups and car, you know, parking tickets and things. But other than that, um, as long as we just get a few bad things and it balances out, that, that that's really what blessing looks like. And as we talk to missionaries and we see people that are laboring for Christ all over the world, we see, would we tell them that? that having very little and having a difficult life is not the blessing of God? No, certainly we would not. But sometimes we sort of practice that idea of westernism and we're supposed to have, a, having stuff is fine. It's not a big, I'm not condemning having things, but it is an idea that when we focus on having things and an easy life, our perspective is out of whack from what the Bible would teach us. And we see that in the text you look at what Paul writes. We rejoice in suffering, and this is why, right? So it changes our rejoicing. And why does it do that? Well, we know that suffering, in verse 3, produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. See, we know that life is not just about the easy road and the easy things we get to do, even though those things are certainly blessings from God. Children, money, all those things are good from God. But if we're to rejoice in all circumstances, even trials, we must view life differently than our Western culture kind of dictates and reminds us to do. We're to view all of life from a different lens. This is the lens I think Paul wants to see is a lens of God working in all things. Not just when you show up on Sunday, although that's a big deal that you could hear the word and be challenged and encouraged, but he's also 
wanting us to see he's working in all things. The circumstances of your life that are challenging, God's at work. The relationships in your life that are challenging, he's at work. And if we forget that, we begin to grow frustrated and distant from people and God. We are often struggling with these kind of difficulties. Whether it's sickness or some form of suffering or just relational difficulty. And in those moments, we wonder if God is for us. We wonder if God is good, let alone rejoice in Him. Tim Keller, Tim Keller quotes it this way um, from a devotion that I've been going through to the Psalms um, called The Songs of Jesus. And he says this, that Christ's death on the cross is a model for how God often works His gracious purpose out through what looks like defeat. When we mistake on that, when we, it's not supposed to be a mistake, when we meditate on that, I was like, that doesn't make sense. Um, autocorrect is such fun. I love it. I love it. When we meditate on that, we will have a resource for facing anything at all. So when we look to Christ and what He has done, when we see the justification He has accomplished for us, we have a resource for facing everything in life. The gospel is where we stand. We stand in grace. And so we can face all these things in life. We can begin to know what God has always promised to do is to work and be with us faithfully. See, knowing we stand justified in God's sight and knowing that he knows us completely and loves us fully, even though he knows all of your junk, just so you know, anything you're hiding, God knows, right? You get that? Right? God knows every darkest place in your soul, just like he knows mine. And yet he comes to you and says, I love you anyways. That's the beauty of what it means. And so we don't have to hide from his work, even in difficulty. And knowing those things opens our eyes to wonder at life and to see with a gospel lens all of its facets. I love the, this chapter of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. And in verses 4 through 6, it really talks about how people are blinded to the greatness and beauty of God's glory in Christ. Um, get it up there? There it is. I'm going to slide over here. So as we think about this, he writes this, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing, this is what we all need to see, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so, our problem is we can't see well. We don't have a right perspective without Christ. But in Christ, the blinders are removed. We have a new perspective, a new way of seeing. And so to the degree that we believe we're justified before God is the measure that we will believe promises like all things work together for our good and God's glory. We don't know it to put on mugs and stuff. We know it because we believe that we stand justified. If God in Christ would declare us righteous, then we can know that he is for us and he is declaring good things into our lives all the time, even through difficulty. We believe promises like he will never leave us or forsake us. He doesn't just check out when you leave the church or when you sin. He's still with you. He pursues you and comes after you. All those promises of God that help us are more and more true in our understanding as we believe this doctrine of justification by faith. We have a new perspective that believes and trusts and sees Christ as the glory of God. That's God's plan for our sanctification is through all things that we may be more like Jesus and his plan is so certain that we can view all things as instruments of grace in his hands. So we no longer look life just as happy times or most helpful. And God has to be in all situations. He has promised to go wherever we go and to be with us always. When I started drinking coffee, my kids think I've always been a coffee drinker. And um, I wasn't. I didn't start drinking coffee until I was 31. And when I went to seminary, I had to get another job um, while I was going to school, and I started at Starbucks. And um, I'd never had coffee, and they made me drink French presses of coffee every day. And I'd come in, and they'd, they'd smash it down and say, what do you think this tastes And I'd write in a little book, my notes, what I thought it tasted like. It's like, oh, that was dirt. <laughs> Delicious. 
And they would read it, and they'd go, really? I said, do you want me to be honest? I'm just being honest. And so then they'd give another one, and I would I'd write it down and go, mm, you have to slurp it. And, mm, mm. and I was like, dark dirt. <laughs> and so over time, I, I would like, oh, that one's okay. It's like, that one's not as bad. And they're like, you really can't tell the customers that. They're like, you want to try the dirt or the dark dirt? What do you want to have? It's like, all right, I'll keep it to myself. But the idea was, over time, and my kids still, a lot of people are like, you drink it black? And I'm like, yeah. But what I learned is an important gospel truth that there's goodness in the bitter. It's not just the sweet that's good. And in the same way, we have to have a different lens that the gospel gives us. We have to see life a little differently because it's real easy to go, well, life, when life's good and I have everything I want and work's good and kids are good, God must be good. But it's easy to get out of that right mindset that God is good all the time, right? That, isn't that an old church thing we do? God is good? That's right, huh? Yeah, you got it. That's right. We know that. But we got to live within that perspective. If you're a follower of Christ, you're called to walk by faith and not by sight and to fix your eyes on what is unseen. We can do this by remembering what God has done for us. He's justified us by our faith in Christ. This keeps us from questioning His love or his goodness toward us. But how does this different perspective, how does that understanding and experience of God's love continue and find sustenance through all of life? Well, it's through the fullness that God gives to the Holy Spirit. And so that's the last thing I want to do. So we've talked about three key effects initially, right? That we are have a new relationship with God. We have a new thing to rejoice in, a new way to rejoice. We have a new perspective. But how do we get full and stay full of God? How do we do that? Well, justification, last point is that justification by faith fills us up with all that God is. If we go back to our text, he says this. God's at work in all these things, right? We have peace with God. We stand in grace. We rejoice in the hope of glory of God. And we even rejoice in sufferings because we know God's at work in that, producing endurance, character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame or doesn't disappoint us because... God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Poured into our hearts. Not dropped into our hearts, but poured. Filling us with love. And so we think this last thing, how do we find fullness in God? See, when God grants us faith, He fulfills His promise to send the Holy Spirit to seal, empower, and glorify Jesus in and through us. So every believer, every follower of Christ has the Holy Spirit. It's not something you go back to the store and get another time. You have the Holy Spirit when you trust Christ. All who have truly repented and trusted Christ have the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 says, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't belong to Christ. So that kind of clears it up for us. So if we belong to God, we have the Spirit. And it says that we know we're God's children because of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God helps us to cry, Abba, Father. We know we belong to God. We are His children. But the Holy Spirit is meant to fill our hearts with the knowledge and experience of God's love for us secured through His Son. That He is there to help remind us of the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus. That when Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would come, that He would comfort and encourage and remind us of all the truth of who Jesus was and all that he was doing. And as we gather and are reminded of this great love through the word and God's spirit, there's a promise that with all the saints, we will be filled up to the fullness of God. I think we've got, put up the Ephesians 3. This prayer is so powerful, what Paul would pray, that I, I think it's incredible that we could think about this. For this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's exactly what we're talking about. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints was the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And this is the promise, that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. 
So as we gather and we consider what God has done, there's a promise that we'd be filled up. Filled up with God's love and mercy. That's why Sundays are so unique. That we get the opportunity to hear from God and to be filled up by His Spirit and His Word. That's no token measure. This is a lavishness that God Himself pours out His love into our hearts. The whole reason that we can rejoice properly and hope in God-honoring ways is because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. And He says, this hope doesn't disappoint us. This hope doesn't put us to shame. And the reason is because you know it's true. That's what a Christian lives their life believing is that one day they will stand before God unashamed because of Christ. If hope was going to put you to shame, it would be when you get there, it's like, nope, not true. Sorry. Didn't turn out like you were hoping. That's a false hope. But we hope in the glory of God and it is true and is eternal. And the Spirit continues to remind us this is why and this is how we know we're loved by God. That's the idea that Paul presented with Abraham, right? Abraham hoped against hope that this would be what was going on would normally be hopeless, but he had a hope that was beyond himself. And when we look at our lives and our families and our culture and the world, we wonder if everything's going to turn out right. But Paul wants us to know that our hope is not in this world turning out just right. Our hope is in God. And that through faith in the life, death, and resurrection of His Son, we will see Him and not be ashamed. There's no condemnation now or ever for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so He floods our souls with that, His love by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So the Word is meant to inflame the Holy Spirit's work in your life. So as it's prot, as we like to say because we don't think preached sounds as good as prot, as a past tense. But as God's word goes into your life in a corporate setting, as you read it on your own at home, it says that God will stir up affections for Christ in you. That his Holy Spirit is not just some sort of the force, that he's actively working to draw you to love Jesus more and to hope in God more. And because God knows we're made of dust, that we're weak and forgetful sheep. He does this. He wisely gives us what we desperately need, himself. He didn't give us just a rule book. He gave us himself. He does that through his Holy Spirit. And so those are the four key effects I want to just look at today. I want to give you four ways to apply it, a, a way to apply each one of them real quickly. Um, and we think about how do you do that? You know, that's a good truth, Matt. We appreciate you. Uh, did good word, brother. Um, but how do we do it, right? We're called to be doers of the word and not just hearers. So I want to give you a little help in that direction. So as we think about peace with God, how do we do We need to remember that peace with God is a fact and not a feeling. Peace with God is a fact and not a feeling because you will go through days that it will not feel like you have peace with God or with anyone else but is based on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and established for all time for those who trust in Christ. You have to remind yourself of the gospel and what God has done to right your relationship with Him. You have to remember who you were and remember what God has done, that now he, we stand in grace forever. That's the first thing. We have to remember that peace with God is a fact and not a feeling. Remind yourself of the gospel. If you're in a small group, second thing, and you're wondering about I don't know that God's my deepest joy. I don't know if He's really my highest joy day in and day out. If you're in a small group, ask them what they think is your highest joy. They know your life, hopefully. And when they look at your life, do they go, Jesus is your highest joy? Seeing Him face to face, knowing Him is your highest joy. Um, we see that in your life. If you're not in a small group, if you're not in community, A, I'd like to talk to you about that. Um, but B, ask your spouse. Ask a good friend that loves Jesus. What do you think my, my deepest joy is? How do you know what my deepest joy is? So you might process, if it's not, you might repent and trust Christ in a fresh way. Especially think through what your hope for eternity is. Is that, because that's where our joy flows from. It's easy to say that our highest joy is kind of easy to diagnose when we look at just different issues in our lives. But if the gospel and God's love for you in Jesus doesn't lead you to exult in Christ, 
to look afresh at God's promises for you in his word. Third thing is we think about a new perspective. Paul Tripp says the best way to evaluate your perspective to everyday life is by what we meditate on. So what fills your heart and mind when you got downtime? When you don't have any other thoughts coming in, you're not reading a good book, just when you're kind of just sitting, vegging, what floods your mind? What do you meditate on? Where does your heart go when nothing else is going on? But we have to be, what he says, is both defensive and offensive in this area. So to make this a habit, this is going to be cool. You're going to love this. This is a great effect I've put into this. You're going to be blown away by the technical savvy I've shown. Um, Before anything else happens in your day, these four things that help you have a right perspective. Gaze on the beauty of Christ. Put Christ before you in his word. Keep thinking. Before you get into your day, try to gaze on the beauty of Christ in his word. Secondly, remember your identity in Christ, who you are. That's how you will walk well, is know who you are in Christ. Rest in his power and provision. Rest in what he is going to do and his strength. Number four, act in reliance upon his grace. So there are four ways to have a different, to cultivate a different perspective that Paul Tripp suggests, I think that are helpful, um, that you can think through, um, especially gazing on the beauty of Christ, for in that you're transformed. That's what 2 Corinthians 3 says. Lastly, to apply the fourth point, to think about the fullness of God, to experience the fullness of God and walk by the Spirit and to bear the fruit of the Spirit, we must continue to hear the word and specifically the truth about Christ with faith. Galatians 3 talks about this. Did you get the Spirit because you work? No, no, you had it by hearing with faith. You heard the word with faith, and that's how we hear the gospel, and we respond with faith, and we're given the Spirit. How do you walk according to the Spirit? You continue to hear the word and let it drive and inflame your affections for Christ. Because that's what the Spirit's doing, is exalting Christ in your life. And so you can continually be hearing the word with faith. And that will help you experience this fullness, this walking according to the Spirit. So I wanted you to see this. I don't think justification by faith is, is a doctrine that stands on an island somewhere. It's like, like Luke when they find him, the last Jedi. He's off on an island hiding. He's just doing his own thing. And that's, like just, that's where we're like, justification by faith, it's on an island. It's really not. It's a day-in, day-out thing you've got to remember and soak in and believe. If you want to have peace with God, you want to really have real joy in God, you want to have a real gospel perspective, and you want to be full with God's love, you need to remember the justification. It's meant to do that. Theology and doxology are tied. And as we think about justification, what a great picture the Lord's table is. What a great picture to remind us of what God has done for us in Christ. As we take these elements today, we're remembering the body and blood of Jesus, that we don't come and make our own meal, right? It's given to us, and we receive it by faith to believe that God has done something, that we're justified not by our own actions or our goodness, but by faith we believe that Christ has done enough. So as we take these elements today, We want to consider Christ, to believe the gospel afresh, not for salvation, but for God to renew a right spirit in each of us, to believe that we stand righteous in his sight, clean and forgiven, peace with God. Sometimes we feel like we've drifted from that. And as we're going to consider in just a minute, you may just need to reflect on that. Have any of these things been true? Do you feel like you're walking at odds with God? Do you feel like you have no joy? terrible perspective, any of those things, if you're struggling with that, to confess them and to draw near to God in a fresh way. The way we do it here, we have a sort of a unique way. We have open communion. And so if you're a person who loves Christ, if you've believed that Jesus is all you need for salvation, if his life, death, and resurrection are enough, and you're a Christian, then you're invited to celebrate the Lord's table with us. That we Take the elements, they come up the outside aisles, get the elements taken back to your seat and we'll take them together. If, if you're not a follower of Christ, if you've never come to a place to go, man, I, I was an enemy of God and I need to be made right with God. If that's not who you are, we just ask that you'd, you'd watch, consider. Consider the things we've talked about. If peace and joy and 
hope in Christ are not yours, that maybe God would stir that. And I'd love to talk with you about it. Or one of the elders would love to talk to you. Because that's what we're made for. And as we celebrate this, that's what this is today. We're going to celebrate what God has done for us in Christ. So you prepare your hearts and, and we'll get everything ready. night that Jesus was spending with his disciples in that upper room he said I'm going to do something new there's going to be a new covenant 
a covenant that's not about being good enough for God. It's going to be a new covenant through my body and my blood. And it's going to declare anyone who believes in me to be righteous forever. And that's why it will be called good news. So, Father, we thank you for these elements. We thank you for the body and blood of Christ. We thank you that in your sovereign wisdom, you sent your son, the fullness of time, to be born of a woman under the law to redeem those of us that we're under the curse of the law. And now we can stand forgiven and at peace with you because of the body and blood of Christ and because of him alone. So help us as we take these elements, Father, to consider Christ, to rejoice in him, renew our perspective, Father, and fill us with great joy and love. We need you and we confess that. And we pray that you'd renew it by your power and spirit for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. going to sing um, verse 2 of He Will Hold Me Fast um, uh, just to finish and just to be reminded that it's not going to be how good your week is it's not going to be how good you are it's going to be how good Christ is and He will hold you fast so let's stand and sing this and we'll do a benediction in just a minute in just a second, but we're also needing help moving chairs at the end, so please, if you are able to stay and help move things, we are cleaning carpets and things this week, so if some guys would stay and help and do that, right after the service, we'll get it knocked out quickly, okay, so remember that. Now, here's the benediction. Receive this. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. You're dismissed.